Hello, everyone. Welcome to the scientific session number three, Oncology, Global, and Anesthesia Analgesia. I'm Barry Rich. I'm a pediatric surgeon at Cohen Children's uh, Medical Center at, in Long Island at Northwell Health. And this is David Rothstein, a pediatric surgeon at O'Shea Children's Hospital at University of Buffalo. Um, I'd like to remind the um, audience that if you're going to ask a question, so please step up to the microphone. Please say your name and institution and affiliation into the microphone. Um, and remember that each uh, presentation is sticking to four minutes, and each question session is also uh, four minutes. In addition, if we have anybody in the audience who is um, scoring the abstracts, please bring the score sheets up to us at the end. Our first abstract is sacral nerve stimulator placement, a novel surgical navigation tool for complex anatomy, presented by Dr. Alejandra M. Casar Berasaluse from uh, Cincinnati Children's Hospital. And we're off to a stunning start. <laughs> it's a video, what the hell? It's a video, then, right? It's a video. There's no nope. video. Wrong video. Hi, everyone. It's Alex Kassar, Research Fellow, Cincinnati Children's. And we'll wait for this. What do you want? That one. That's it. That's what I mean. Yeah. Constipation and fecal incontinence. By delivering electrical impulses through a probe placed That's near the sacral nerve, this technology acts like a pacemaker to promote bowel and sphincter function. Can you start it again, please? First pass. Sacral neuromodulation is a therapy aimed at improving the quality of life of patients with constipation and fecal incontinence. By delivering electrical impulses through a probe placed near the sacral nerve, this technology acts like a pacemaker to promote bowel and sphincter function. Placement at our institution happens in a hybrid operating room equipped with a C-arm cone beam CT and a surgical navigation system. Using this technique enables us to offer this therapy to patients with dysplastic or malformed sacra whose anatomy would be otherwise prohibitive for traditional or purely fluoroscopic interventions. The patient is placed under general anesthesia and positioned prone with a pelvic roll for elevation and stabilization. A Foley catheter is inserted and grounding pads are applied. The surgical site is then prepped and draped in usual sterile fashion with the drapes fastened under the bed to allow C-arm rotation and easy access to the patient's feet for electrode testing. Anatomical landmarks for the intervention are identified and confirmed fluoroscopically. The horizontal axis is marked at the posterior inferior iliac spine in the cranial aspect of the sciatic notch. The vertical axis are traced overlying the medial aspect of the S3 neural foramina bilaterally, roughly two centimeters from the midline. Using the ruled needle provided, conventional skin entry points are marked two centimeters cranially to these intersections. These would provide access to the S3 foramina at a 60 degree angle in the traditional approach without navigation. A cone beam CT run is acquired intraoperatively and a three-dimensional model constructed for procedural guidance. The target anatomy is identified and a virtual path is created from the skin surface to the desired electrode location and evaluated in multiple views. The virtual tip location is confirmed with the patient's intraoperative scan. The plant needle entry site is then marked with real-time image guidance. In this case, it was identified around one centimeter caudal to the traditional markings. The needle is inserted under live fluoroscopy to maintain proper angulation. The needle tip location is then confirmed with multimodal navigation. The proximity to the sacral nerve is assessed through electrical stimulation. A bellows contraction identifies proper placement at the S3 foramen with confirmation by plantar flexion of the great toe. A guide wire is inserted and position is again confirmed with imaging. Insertion of the neuromodulation lead is then accomplished with standard Seldinger technique using the dilator sheath provided. Location is once again reassessed before removing the guide wire and dilator. The marker should be visible halfway through the foramen. A tined lead is then inserted under live visualization until the third and fourth marks straddle the interior edge of the sacrum. 
This lead consists of four digital electrodes, times or barbs for stabilization, distance markers, and four proximal connectors. Lead positioning is confirmed with the bellows and toe response. The sheet is removed under live lead stabilization. Final placement is evaluated with navigation software, and a post-procedure x-ray is obtained. A small incision is made and a pocket developed over the contralateral gluteus to accommodate the remaining lead. This is where the generator is to be implanted after the initial test period. The pocket is irrigated and hemostasis is obtained with electrocautery. The lead is tunneled subcutaneously to the pocket with caution to prevent dislodgement. It is then attached to the temporary lead extension and screwed in tightly until clicks are heard. The plastic guard is slipped over the connection and secured tightly with non-absorbable sutures, proximally and distally. A second subcutaneous tunnel is created to bring the lead extension across the midline to its temporary exit site through the skin. The pocket is closed in layers, and all incisions are covered with surgical glue. The lead extension is connected to the external generator and secured in place with adequate padding. Over the next two to four weeks, the patient's bowel function is carefully recorded and compared to previous records. If a positive effect is demonstrated with newer modulation, a permanent generator is implanted in a second stage. If unsuccessful, the lead can be removed without permanent damage to the nerve. Time for one question, please. Question, um, is this done by pediatric surgeons in addition to interventional radiologists or only pediatric surgeons? Uh, in, in Cincinnati, they're currently doing it together uh, in the hybrid OR or in one of the extra IR suites, uh, but it's mostly done by the pediatric surgeons, by your colorectal team. Use for transcription, Dr. That's Dr. Jordan from North Carolina. North Carolina. So, um, any effects on bladder function? Uh, not at this uh, at this level. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. The next abstract will be nerve derived signal assist tissue repair by mandibular skeletal stem cells by Dr. R. Ellen Jones from Stanford. Can we reset the timer, please, to four minutes? Like a basketball referee. It's present our work. I've no disclosures. And there we go. So in the Long Acre Lab, I've been studying the nerve dependency of purified groups of stem cells, specifically the mouse skeletal stem cell. We previously shown that these are the cells that are responsible for regenerating and repairing bone in the mouse mandible. This is the skeletal stem cell hierarchy here. You can see the skeletal stem cell, or the SSC, is the least differentiated in this hierarchy and gives rise to more downstream populations, such as the cartilage and bone progenitors. These are the cells that make bone and cartilage during mandibular regeneration and repair. My hypothesis for this project was that SSC and active mandibular healing would be nerve dependent. So in previous presentations and talks, I've already shown a novel model of inferior alveolar nerve denervation and its validation. I've shown that fracture healing in the presence of denervation is impaired with poor bone formation, and that this is linked to a specific deficit in skeletal stem cells in the presence of denervation. Specifically, the cells are um, diminished in presence and in function. So we wanted to then further investigate the underlying mechanism for these findings. And specifically, we wanted to know which cellular component of the inferior alveolar nerve was specifically implicated in mandibular healing. In order to do this, we took tissue sections of the inferior alveolar nerve housed in the mandibular canal here. You can see the nerve outlined by the white dotted line and performed immunohistochemistry to look at the axonal component, which is stained red in the PGP 9.5 labeled um, panels. 
And then we also stain for Schwann cells, which are marked by PLP and are in the green channels. You can see in the denervated panels on the bottom that there's a marked disruption in tissue architecture overall. And when we quantified the amount of red and green staining in innervated versus denervated, we found no difference in red, so same amount of axonal staining, but significantly decreased amount of PLP or Schwann cell staining. This allowed us to hypothesize that mouse skeletal stem cells were dependent specifically on Schwann cells to enact mandibular healing. So we wanted to test this mechanism further, and um, we wanted to set up a co-culture experiment to specifically look at the paracrine interactions that could potentially be occurring between Schwann cells and skeletal stem cells. In order to do this, we um, did a co-culture experiment in which Schwann cells and skeletal stem cells from denervated mandible fractures were cultured together across an intervening membrane. This membrane allowed transport of cellular products between the cell groups, but no direct contact of the cells themselves. So we were able to show that the skeletal stem cells that were incubated in the presence of Schwann cells had significantly increased colony forming units as compared to those that were incubated with media alone. And this is important because uh, one of the major defects that we found with denervated skeletal stem cells with it that was that they were in fact unable to produce colonies in culture. So this indicates a lack of self-renewal ability of stem cells. So having uh, established this paracrine relationship between Schwann cells and the skeletal stem cells, we then wanted to investigate some candidate ligands and receptors that could be specifically playing a part in this paracrine system. So we performed quantitative PCR and looked at some ligands by Schwann cells and some um, growth factor receptors by skeletal stem cells and showed that there were a few that had previously been implicated in nerve-dependent healing that were found to be present on a transcriptional level in both cell types, specifically PDGF, parathyroid hormone, and oncostatin M. So we then wanted to see how these factors could potentially rescue the denervated uh, lack of healing after fracture in the mouse mandible. So you can see the vehicle group, uh, the control group um, here with the fracture showing poor closure on micro CT and additionally on a histological level poor cellular elaboration in the fracture cap. However, when we add each of these um, factors back to the mouse mandible, um, which were added at postoperative days one and 10 after fracture, the um, healing is significantly improved on a histological and CT level. And this was significant when comparing bone volume versus tissue volume across all groups. So in summary, we have presented a novel model of inferior alveolar nerve denervation and shown that skeletal stem cells do exhibit nerve dependency during mandibular healing, <clears throat> and that the underlying mechanism for this appears to be that Schwann cells and their paracrine signals are responsible for uh, proper skeletal stem cell function, and that this circuitry um, kind of requires some more study to further investigate. So I'd like to thank my PI, Dr. Lonnie and the rest of our lab, and I'd be happy to take any questions at this time. Any questions from the audience? Remember, please state your name and institution. Chris Reed from Duke and Durham. Um, thanks for the talk. I was hoping to buy you just one minute to talk a little bit more about how you identified your candidate uh, paracrine signals. Um, you only showed us a few of the potentials. Thank you, yes. We did a comprehensive literature search to investigate things that had already been described. And these were a few of the factors. We also tested a few others, such as vasopressin, and that wasn't found to be implicated in our um, PCR experiment. However, we do hope to perform for further uh, less biased investigations with like bulk RNA level or some protein assays to further um, understand this. Looking to the future, can you tell us about clinical applications? Yes, so we know that patients with mandibular fractures often have nerve injury either iatrogenically or from their fracture itself, and they still seem to heal okay. So I think that this biology, rather than um, being used to you know, fix a glaring clinical problem, is more uh, something we can extrapolate to improve healing at a baseline. So whether people have nerve injuries or not, if we can identify some growth factors or chemical signals that can improve bone healing, we can then give those back to patients and in any context to hopefully speed or improve their healing. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh. Jose? Um, I have not thought about it that way, but... Um, I'm sure it would be an interesting study. We know that there are many invertebrates that can regenerate, and there's several regenerative paradigms that could be examined, like in um, some sea, and, like aquatic animals. Um, but of course, I have not investigated that myself. 
Dr. Jose Prince from uh, Long Island Jewish Cohen Children's. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so sorry, we have a video to present um, uh, as part of our ongoing tributes. Uh, this is going to be uh, dedicated to Dr. Raymond Emery, who is the APSIS 24th president and a charter member of APSIS, prepared by uh, Dr. Uh, Mike Norman, uh, who is now at um, Children's Mercy in Kansas City. So, Tom, if we can do the tribute video, please. What if I told you that a kid from Staten Island can make his way to the top of a trying and competitive profession while leaving a trail of love and respect from his patients, family, friends, and colleagues in his wake? It's hard to even, I, it's hard to even know where to start. Ray's father, Alphonse, moved to Brooklyn in 1912, where he worked with his father. Ray's mother immigrated to New York from Damascus, Syria in 1903 and married Alphonse in 1926. Ray was born in 1928. He was fond of his home and always retained a trace of his accent. Oh, buddy. After he volunteered for the Army in 1945 at 17 years old, he returned to Staten Island where he attended Wagner College and graduated cum laude. He completed his residencies in general, thoracic, and pediatric surgery under Dr. Thomas Santulli at Babies Hospital. In 1968, he moved to Kansas City to become Surgeon-in-Chief at Children's Mercy Hospital, a position he held for 30 years. Along with his colleagues, Dr. Keith Ashcraft and Thomas Holder, he would help establish Children's Mercy Hospital as a leader in the surgical care of infants and children in the region and to build an international reputation for the hospital. He was extremely well known. He wrote, uh, wrote a lot of changes, editor of the journal, he was president of Amsterdam. He and Drs. Holder and Ashtreff made a great team. They were a powerful trio, made Children's Mercy what it is today. During his tenure, he directed and helped found the Children's Mercy Pediatric Surgery Residency, which would go on to train many leaders in the field. They started the training program. If it hadn't been for Ray Bird Dog in that, we wouldn't have had a training program. Ray was a master teacher. He was very well known for his interest in education. Dr. Angry was just a pleasure to be around because he loved being a teacher. He loved to teach. I never saw Dr. Emery do a case himself. He was the guy who kind of let you know you could operate. He let you do it. Dr. Emery was good, but he would let you get in trouble. But he did a lot of teaching around the world teaching rounds. You go out and spend a few hours in the rounds and you know, patient, there was uh, a lesson to be learned. Uh, he was incredibly smart. He was just full of all kinds of um, useful and even arcane knowledge about yeah. pediatric surgery that you just wouldn't get from from other people. Everyone you ask has a story about Dr. Amory. He took pictures of everything. If he said, flash the blue thing, that would add about two hours to the operation. He would be explaining something to a resident. I would interject my comment. He would say, Miss Sitton, no collegiality, please. <laughs> when I was a fellow, we had a resident who was sort of marginal. Oh, he said he had a Lord procedure for Merkel's. <laughs> So we rounded with Dr. Amory one time. We got to the door and I said, this is a kid who had a Lord procedure for a Merkel's and he didn't say anything. And at the end of rounds, he pulls me over and says, it's, it's called a Merkel's diverticulum. <laughs> His career was marked by the highest achievement. He served as chair of the Missouri chapter of the American College of Surgeons and in 1994 was president of the American Pediatric Surgical Association. What stood out most were his good nature and the close relationships he formed. Once he met you, he never forgot you. Never. Remember everybody's name, their kids' names, their wife's names, their sister's names. Everything you ever read, everybody you ever met. Who your husband was, the names and ages of your children. Who an article and let you know where it was, where on the page things were. He knew the names of my kids, everybody's kids. Yeah. Their birth dates. I mean, he was, he was just fantastic. Great memory. I can't say enough nice things about Ray Amory. He was really... He's a good guy. Fantastic guy. Yeah. One of the nicest people you ever meet. Mm -hmm. One of those people that if someone said they didn't like him, you'd immediately assume there was something wrong with the person <laughs> that said that. In his presidential address, he emphasized the fact that most pediatric surgeons were good teachers and enthusiastic role models. Dr. John Schulinger wrote, Among those, Ray Amory was foremost. This and his love for children, his concern over their safety and quality of care, 
were the hallmarks of his professional life and his lasting legacy. Thank you, Mike. Thanks to Dr. Dorman, who's in the audience. That was very nicely done. Nice tribute. Our next abstract is um, triptolide inhibits DVL2 expression and downregulates catenin and mix target genes in human neuroblastoma, presented by Dr. Jordan Taylor from Stanford. All right. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present. Let's see if we can do this. We have no financial disclosures. Uh, okay. So, um, neuroblastoma, as we all know, is a very common pediatric extracranial malignancy. <laughs> it accounts for 10% of all childhood tumors and up to 15% of all pediatric cancer deaths. Survival is highly dependent upon, sorry about that, uh, about, upon tumor biology with uh, high risk disease having a survival still around 50% despite our multimodal therapy and advancements in treatments. MIC-N amplification is one of the factors that distinguishes a high-risk tumor. Uh, MIC-N amplified tumors have deregulated MIC and beta-catenin pathways. This leads to an overexpression of high levels of MIC proteins. Uh, these tumors are resistant to therapy and often pretend a poor prognosis. Sorry. Triptolide, uh, sorry for the slides here. Triptolide is something that's been recently described in the literature as having anti-tumor properties, specifically in pancreatic cancer, as affecting and decreasing MYC expression. Triptolide is from the Thunder Duke vine. It's actually used in uh, traditional Chinese medicine um, for several ailments and, and led to us wanting to study this in this project. So the aim of this project was to assess triptolide as a potential adjuvant therapy for high-risk neuroblastoma. We hypothesized that triptolide could inhibit neuroblastoma cell growth, and this would be via downregulation of MYC and beta-catenin pathways. To look at this, we used two neuroblastoma cell lines, SKNAS and CLBGA, two lines that have high MYC levels. We also were interested to see if uh, triptolide could be used to treat cells that were resistant to other conventional treatments. We used cells that had been previously treated with vincristine or cisplatin and proven resistant to those therapies. These cells were derived from a xenograft that was treated with a combination therapy, and then residual tumor was then plated. We treated all of these cell lines with increasing doses of triptolide uh, from 24 to 72 hours. We analyzed these with Western blot and quantitative PCR for protein and mRNA expression, as well as immunohistochemistry. <clears throat> Excuse me. What we found is that triptolide has a dose-dependent cytotoxic effect on both of our uh, commercial cell lines. We also found when we compared uh, the untreated SKNS cells here in black uh, to those that had been previously treated with vincristine and cisplatin, there was a similar cytotoxicity. We confirmed that these cells that had been previously treated with vincristine and cisplatin were indeed resistant to vincristine and cisplatin through some in, vi in vitro assays. You can see the, the black bars here, the cells that had not been previously treated were much more susceptible to vincristine as compared to the ones that had been previously treated. All of this to say that triptolide could be used essentially to treat cells that were resistant to vincristine or cisplatin. When we went to investigate the mechanism behind this, we used uh, quantitative PCR and we found that treated cells had decreased levels, decreased expression of disheveled 2 and MYC. Disheveled 2 is a component of the Wnt signaling pathway and an activator of beta-catenin. When we looked at some of the downstream uh, regulated genes, we found also a decrease in expression of these, including nucleus stemin, one of the cell cycle regulators. On Western blot analysis, we again found that disheveled 2 was downregulated uh, in treated cells in both, uh, both of our commercially available lines. We also found that that downstream regular, regulator nucleus stemin uh, was also decreased in, in the treated cells. On immunohistochemistry, we found, excuse me, we found that beta-catenin was uh, slightly decreased, shown here in green, with treatment of triptolide, but the downstream regulator nucleus, sorry, downstream protein nucleus stemin was even more significantly decreased, shown here in red. So what we've demonstrated is that triptolide has a cytotoxic effect against multiple uh, cell lines, some that are resistant to vincristine and cisplatin. Um, we propose that this mechanism is through an inhibition of disheveled 2 and MYC proteins, leading to a uh, decrease in beta-catenin and MYC target genes. 
In the future, we hope to translate this work into our uh, in vivo model using a xenograph uh, and try triptolide as a treatment, both systemically and uh, as a local therapy. Uh, thank you for your time and I'd like to thank my PI, Dr. Chu, and happy to take any questions. Any questions, please step up the mic. David from Memphis. Um, so you mentioned in your introductory slide that NMIC is a bad prognostic factor in neuroblastoma, which is, of course, true. Um, but you said your drug is acting on CMIC. So I guess the question is, can it act on both? And can you tell us about your cell lines? I know SKNES has overexpression of CMIC is not NMIC amplified. I'm not familiar with the other one. So how interchangeable is its activity? Yeah. So you're, you're absolutely correct. NMIC is a very poor prognostic factor for these tumors. SKNAS, as you pointed out, does not have high levels of NMIC, but does have high levels of MIC family proteins and also has a, has a poor prognosis and, and um, is, is considered one of the more advanced tumor lines. The other tumor line does not have uh, amplified uh, MIC-N either. It is also one that expresses high MIC. Um, we're looking into using other cell lines that do express um, high MIC-N, such as Kelly cells or um, you know, even patient-derived cells and things like that to investigate it. Hi, nice talk. Um, Liz Byerly from Alabama. I'm just wondering about the your LD50 for this um, drug is pretty high, and I'm wondering if you're going to be able to, or if you have any idea if those that high of a concentration can actually be achieved in vivo in humans. So I, I can't speak to the uh, in vivo in humans. I'm not. I'm not sure if, if we can achieve that. Um, in our preliminary studies, as we've started to move this to mice, we are finding that uh, it's a complicated drug to work with. That it has pretty high high toxicity, uh, even at some of the lower concentrations. So we're we're working to. Uh, optimize that a bit so that we can deliver the drug locally, essentially, to the tumor. Thank you. <clears throat> Tell us about resistance. What, um, what proportion of neuroblastoma is resistant, and is there a difference in terms of your model between tumors that are natively resistant or develop resistance to treatment? I'm sorry, that, that last one is... So are there, is there a difference, particularly as it regards to your model, between tumors that are sort of born resistant mm -hmm. or develop resistance after therapy? So. As far as the, the proportion that develop resistance, high risk neuroblastoma, around 30% uh, are considered resistant. Um, the, there are certain changes that are definitely seen in uh, cell populations that are previously treated. Um, they develop a different phenotype, particularly in histology and different uh, prognosis factors. Um, large cell neuroblastoma is something that we're looking at, and this is a, a subpopulation of treated cells that have become resistant essentially and, and, and confirm sort of this poor prognosis. Um, other than that, I can't speak too much more to how they change. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> the next abstract is titled PIM Kinase Mediate Cisplatin Resistance in Hepatoblastoma uh, to be presented by Dr. Rode Mariati from the University of Alabama. Thank you. I have no disclosures. Children with metastatic or relapsed hepatoblastoma have limited options. Up to 80% develop chemoresistance after four to five cycles. Stem cell-like cancer cells um, are a subset of cancer cells that um, have the pluripotency capability. And um, these cells have been shown to play an important role in chemoresistance and disease relapse. Characteristics of these cells include expression of cell surface markers, um, such as CD133, and their ability to form tumor spheres in serum-free conditions. We found that cisplatin, which is the most active single agent in hepatoblastoma, increased percentage of CD133 cells in a dose-dependent manner. So we asked the question, what drives chemoresistance in hepatoblastoma? And we think um, proviral insertion site in Maloney leukemia virus or PIM kinases are involved. And this is a family of oncogenes that is overexpressed in hepatoblastoma and function to promote tumor genesis. PIM kinases, we've also shown that main, they maintain a stem cell like phenotype. When we treat um, with AZD1208, which is a small molecule PIM inhibitor, 
um, we found that CD133 expression decreases in a dose-dependent manner, which tells us that PIM inhibition effectively targets the stem cell-like population. And this is in vitro. In vivo, when we combined PIM inhibition with cisplatin, um, we found that um, the mice had significantly decreased tumor volumes when um, we're looking at the combination of PIM inhibition and cisplatin compared to either drug alone. So these findings led us to hypothesize that PIM kinases mediate resistance to cisplatin chemotherapy and hepatoblastoma by maintaining a stem cell-like phenotype. And to study this, we uh, first wanted to develop a cisplatin-resistant model of a hepatoblastoma patient-derived xenograft and evaluate the effects of PIM inhibition on cisplatin-resistant cells. We got these cells by um, taking a tumor, a uh, patient-derived xenograft from a, patient, from a human patient, and engrafting that in mice, and then passaging um, in ethymic nude mice um, from one mouse to mouse. Um, to develop, we treated these mice with cisplatin twice weekly to develop res re resistant cells, and we compared th these cells to um, naive cells, which we got from mice that underwent the same exact, pro exact process but were not treated with cisplatin. We first wanted to look at proliferation and viability. And what we found is, um, in fact, that our resistant cells have greater proliferation and greater viability um, at the same dose of cisplatin compared to the naive cells. This confirms our resistance model. Um, we then um, looked at the stem cell-like uh, cancer cell frequency, and we found that resistant cells express CD133 at a higher frequency. They also form tumor spheres more readily than the naive cells. We wanted to add PIM inhibition, and when we treat with um, AZD1208 at one micromolar and five micromolar, um, we, the resistant cells, um, this leads to decreased, significantly decreased cell proliferation um, and basically sensitizing our cisplatin resistant cells to cisplatin. When we look at um, com combination um, methods using the method of Chow and Talale, our combination indices were less than one, indicating synergy between the two drugs. Um, PIM inhibition um, finally effectively targeted the stem cell-like phenotype um, and resulted in significantly decreased tumor sphere formation in the resistant cells. In conclusion, I hope that I've shown you that PIM inhibition resensitized cisplatin resistant cells to cisplatin and decreased proliferation, viability, and tumor sphere formation. This is very promising um, because basically if we can combine PIM inhibition with cisplatin to potentially overcome cisplatin resistance in the treatment of metastatic or relapsed hepatoblastoma. I'd like to thank Dr. Elizabeth Byerly, my mentor, the Byerly Lab at UAB, our collaborators and funding resources, and I'll take questions. Questions from the audience? I guess I'll ask about stock resistance questions. Well, how often do you see uh, cisplatin resistance in hepatoblastoma? So, a lot, I guess, so when kids come in with resectable disease, we take it out. Um, however, when kids come in with advanced disease or um, with, uh, they get chemotherapy, um, about what's published that about 54 to 80% develop resistance after four to five cycles. Um, so I feel like that's a, that's a good portion of kids. All right, thank you. Wait, uh, that any? question? David off at Memphis. Um, very nice uh, presentation. I, I wonder if you've done what to me seems something a little bit easier to prove your point, which is just to knock out your PIM and see if then, uh, see what the effect uh, is, rather than serial passaging in mice, which, which is a long and laborious yes. experiment. So Yes, so we have, the, this is something we're doing. Um, we have established um, CRISPR-Cas9 knockout of PIM, uh, PIM3, which is what we think is the most important um, PIM kinase in the family. There are three of them in the family of PIM kinases. Um, and, and we're exactly doing that right now. We're looking at um, LD50 of cisplatin and, and um, the resistant uh, downstream molecules. Great, thank you. Great. 
The next abstract is Differential Expression of Human Endogenous Retrovirus K in Hepatoblastoma to be presented by Dr. David Grabsky from the University of Virginia. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for the opportunity to present our work. Today I'll be presenting the differential expression of human endogenous retrovirus K. We have no disclosures. Human endogenous retroviruses represent a group of viruses that infected human germ lines. Once integrated into the genome, these viruses can be vertically transmitted to progeny over successive generations and eventually become fixed in the human genome. There have been numerous integrations of herbs over evolutionary time. There are 40 classified groups and represent up to 8% of the human genome. The most recent integration of HERV-K seen by the red box is the most recent integration over the past one to five million years. It's currently polymorphic in the human population. A key aspect of HERV-K biology is that they remain transcriptionally silent under normal cell conditions. However, under conditions there are where there are pardon me conditions where herbs are upregulated, tumor biology is perhaps one of the most well studied examples, including melanoma and breast cancer. The image on the left demonstrates immunohistological stainings of herb K gag and envelope protein in melanoma samples, but not in benign tissue, highlighting the differential expression between viral proteins and cancer, but again not in normal disease, not normal tissue. Herbs have been implicated in numerous solid organ tumors, including colorectal cancer hepatobiliary cancer, renal cell carcinoma, though they remain understudied in childhood cancers. While it remains unclear whether herbs have a role in the initiation of oncogenesis, there is growing evidence that herbs' expression is linked to survival, disease progression, as well as may represent intriguing neoantigens <clears throat> in immunotherapy. Another condition where herb cray expression has been well described is in embryogenesis. This data from a virology group at Stanford demonstrates the development of HERV-K viral-like particles by electron microscopy in the human blastocele. Furthermore, the group demonstrated that HERV-K transcription is progressively silenced through epigenetic modifications as somatic differentiation progresses during fetal development. And this brings us to the central hypothesis of our investigation. Since HERV-K is expressed during embryogenesis and is progressively silenced during somatic differentiation, HERV-K may continue to be expressed in fetal tumors that fail to differentiate. As we just heard from our preceding talk, hepatoblastoma is the most common pediatric malignant tumor and is thought to arise from a failure of differentiation of hepatocytes. It may potentially fit this primary hypothesis of our investigation regarding the persistent expression of HERF-K, particularly in undifferentiated tumors. However, HERF-K's elements are difficult to research as they remain unannotated in the human genome. Meaning under standard RNA-seq differential gene expression analysis, these elements will not be evaluated and will remain in the dark matter of the human genome. As such, with a team of retrovirologists and computational biologists at the University of Virginia, we developed a bioinformatics tool to allow for transcriptome analysis of HERF-K elements. This primarily involved creating a sequence database of all previously identified HERF-K proviruses, which is identified by the carrier type here. We then used our bioinformatics HERF-K tool to analyze publicly available RNA-seq data of 10 hepatoblastomas and three normal livers uh, created from the University of uh, Pittsburgh Children's Hospital. And this basic table different, uh, essentially shows the differential expression of HERF-K proviruses at multiple locations. This is one of the first discoveries of HERF-K expression in fetal solid organ tumors. Even more to the point, the idea is that we are able to identify which proviruses themselves are overexpressed. In this case, four proviruses seem potentially biological interesting, given their significant log full change, as well as a significant p-value. Uh, uh, in, in quick summary, at the particular case of the provirus at 20q1122, this simple scattle plot of log two normalized FPKM gene expression values across hepatoblastoma, again located on the right, and normal liver code located on the left, demonstrates that every hepatoblastoma had HERF-K expression, whereas none of the normal livers did. This absolute discrepancy in expression makes this a potentially intriguing target as a tuber marker. In summary, through creating a bioinformatics HERF-K tool, we can now quickly and easily evaluate the transcriptome of fetal tumors. Future directions of this work include uh, using this tool to evaluate additional fetal tumors um, in addition to looking at the actual kind of uh, effects biologically um, that these viruses may be driving.
I'd like to thank my primary scientific mentor in this project, Dr. Sarah Rasmussen. And I look forward to any questions. Firely Lab, any questions? <laughs> so, <laughs> can I say they, they really want you to speak in the microphone to, for transcription purposes? <laughs> So I guess I'm sitting here pondering, um, is, this a, is this a biomarker that could potentially be shed in the blood that we could use for early detection? Is it a biomarker that we could use for therapeutic intervent or to monitor therapeutic interventions, or is it a therapeutic target? So which do you, I'm, I'm trying to wrap my hand around this thing that you don't have a sequence for, but you can kind of find in the transcriptome based on a pro. It's just very nebulous to me about how this can actually come and help me as a, a clinical surgeon. Yeah, sure. So I would say both, actually. So the idea that it, it could, uh, uh, in a lot of solid organ tumors, it does seem to track with with disease. And so it, uh, the transcripts have been described in serum, and so it can be used as a potential biomarker. But I think the, the most novel use of this uh, is in development of immunotherapeutic targets, exactly that. So these proviral proteins, including an envelope protein that sits on the membrane of the cell itself, has been targeted by CAR T cells, both in melanoma and breast cancer. And they're generating both adaptive and innate immune responses in these tumors. And so really, I think the, the uh, most novel application will be as very specific targets for, uh, for potentially diseases where they're differentially expressed. And is there an oncogenic virus out there that you could potentially use right now against these viruses? I, I mean, so they're, they're embedded in the genome. So there's no real way to um, uh, target the viruses themselves. I mean, we all have them. They're embedded in the genome. And so I think that uh, really the idea would be to, uh, to target them once they're expressed. But I don't know how we could silence them uh, uh, in any other way. So super, super quick question, please. Uh, Andrew Murphy from Memphis. Um, I noticed that one of the uh, chromosomal loci that you had listed as significant for expression was 7P13.1, mm -hmm. and that's where P53 is. So I wondered if you had looked and seen whether this integration was disrupting P53 expression or not. Yeah, no, I, I, I haven't, but it's an excellent point. Um, and I think that that's one of the, the highlights of this tool is is many of the past studies have just talked about her of K expression um, kind of in total. And now we're getting to that granularity where we can see where they're integrating and what genes might be affected. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. Okay, next up, uh, Dr. Kokui will be presenting, no, yes, Dr. Kokui from uh, UNC, who will be presenting on the set of reductive surgery and hyperthermic intracranial chemotherapy, HYPEC in pediatric type malignancies, a clinical characteristics of long-term survivors. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present our work. Um, since you read the title, I won't do that. Um, I have no disclosures. So the purpose of this study was to assess the efficacy of cytoreductive surgery and hyperthermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy on recurrence-free and overall survival in children and young adults who presented with peritoneal-based malignancies, and further to look within that group of patients uh, amongst just those who achieved some long-term survival and to try to assess for clinical characteristics that associated with such survival. So uh, to give some background, HIPEC was performed at the conclusion of cytoreduction in these patients. Heated concentrated chemotherapy was circulated typically at a temperature of 41 degrees Celsius um, at the conclusion of the cytoreduction. The specific chemotherapy agent utilized was based on the patient's histology, and roughly 83% of the patients in this uh, study were perfused with cisplatin. The perfusate circulated through inflow and outflow cannulas, as you see, as you see depicted here, An interperitoneal temperature was measured uh, throughout the perfusion cycle to ensure proper circulation. Patients were given significant IV fluid resuscitation preoperatively, and those perfused with cisplatin were also given sodium thiosulfate perioperatively to neutralize any of the drug that's made its way into the systemic bloodstream. So this was a retrospective review of a prospectively collected database. These are all patients treated at one institution over 14 years. There were 154 patients that were analyzed, and outcomes that were evaluated were recurrence-free, progression-free, and overall survival. 
So previously at the same institution, a phase one clinical trial was performed to assess uh, dose safety of the cisplatin. Uh, and in 20 patients, the most significant uh, adverse effect that was noted was a transient rise in the patient's baseline creatinine that normalized prior to the patient being discharged home. But in general, the therapy was very well tolerated, which is similar to what we saw in the larger cohort of 154 patients. So in the 154 patients, 106 were male. Uh, the median age was just over 16 years. The median PCI score was 17, and 84% uh, of patients had at least one prior resection prior to undergoing treatment at our institution. The, um, when you look at the histological distribution, the most common diagnosis was desmoplastic small round cell tumor, which was a diagnosis in just over 65% of patients. Another 15% of patients had other non-DSRCT type sarcomas, 7% had carcinomas, and the rest of the distribution you see here. So then when we looked uh, at patients in two groups, those who achieved an overall survival since the time of surgery versus those who did not, we saw that amongst those patients who achieved over four years, they uh, statistically had a lower PCI score and they were, had a significantly lower incidence of disease within mm -hmm. their retroperitoneal lymph nodes. When we looked further at just the DSRCT patients only, we tried to assess the uh, contribution of a CCR0 resection on their survival, and while the survival was slightly better, it did not meet statistical significance. However, when we further grouped the DSRCT patients into clinical stages, we saw that stage one patients, these are patients that had disease limited to just one anatomical site, such as the omentum or the pelvis, they had statistically better progression-free and event-free survival compared to those with multi-site disease. So in conclusion, HIPEC in our patients was very well tolerated. Uh, lower PCI score and the absence of retroperitoneal nodal disease did correlate with longer overall survival. Um, DSRCT patients with single site disease seem to have uh, improved survival compared to those with multi-site involvement. And further studies necessary to completely characterize the specific contribution of HIPEC on local control efforts in DSRCT and other peritoneal-based malignancies in children. Thank you very much. Jonathan Karpilovsky from Sydney. Did you exclude patients with metastatic hepatic disease? And if not, what effect did that have on survival? Because I couldn't quite pick that up from the data. So um, if, we, if you look at, um, for DSRCT, we did not exclude patients that had uh, disease to their liver as long as they could, their pet avid disease could be completely resected. And in general, we saw lower overall survival amongst those who did have hepatic disease despite that treatment. Max Sang in Memphis, um, thank you, and enjoyed the talk very much. Um, Ziopel 6 randomized patients to use of sodium thiosulfate when getting high dose cisplatinum and found no benefits and maybe some cancer progression in patients with high dose thiosulfate. So I'm curious if you could just teach us about the background data for use of it in this setting. So the reason we use the sodium thiosulfate was. Um, like, like I mentioned, to try to bind the any cisplatin that's made its way into the bloodstream. Um, very early on in that phase one clinical trial, the, the dose of cisplatin was escalated from 100 milligrams uh, per meter squared to 150, and we saw a little bit higher degree of renal toxicity at that dose. So it was taken back down to 100, and that's what all of the 154 patients were treated with. Since we've adhered to sort of that protocol of the dose of 100 along with the sodium thiosulfate and aggressive IV fluid resuscitation, we've had very good outcomes in terms of preventing renal toxicity. So I don't have a more satisfying answer, I guess, in terms of the tumor progression question. I think what Dr. Lang, Andrea Hayes Jordan from University of North Carolina, I think that what Dr. Langan was asking is about sodium thiosulfate in general and why, if it has had any negative effects um, in the patients that we've had. We haven't seen any negative effects, but we did. The reason we use it is when we started in the phase one trial, we started it at time zero of the HIPEC, time 30, of, 30 minutes into the 90 minute HIPEC, and then at the end of the HIPEC. And of those three time points, the middle one and the one giving it at the, um, at the end had the best outcome as far as a decrease in cisplatin toxicity. But we haven't noticed any of the negative side effects, but we did test in the beginning uh, the timing and whether it would be advantageous. And in some of the um, adult patients at MD Anderson that did not have the sodium thiosulfate, they had 
fairly severe um, renal toxicity. Are there any exclusion criteria? Or I guess who would you not offer HIPEC to? So, so it was not offered to any patients who didn't uh, respond significantly to their chemotherapy preoperatively or patients that still had pet avid disease outside of the abdominal cavity. Thank you. I'm going to switch uh, gears a little bit and look at our global surgery component of this session. Next talk is on essential surgery and anesthesia packets for children at the first level, ho level hospital. Guidelines from the Global Initiative for Children's Surgery, Dr. Grabsky, uh, from representing multiple institutions here. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity to present. We have no disclosures. The Lancet Commission on Global Surgery estimated that 5 billion people around the globe lack access to safe surgery. This includes 1.7 billion children that also <clears throat> lack access, most of whom live in low and middle income countries. Models from the Disease Control Priority 3 on essential surgery in 2015 demonstrated that the majority of the burden of surgical disease could be averted by scaling up basic surgical care delivery at first level hospitals, also at the district level and or the first level hospital. This is an important recommendation as the district level hospital is the first level in the healthcare system that has both surgical and general anesthesia capability. Furthermore, up to 90% of patients receive care at this level. As such, the WHO has identified the first level hospital as a priority site for improving access to surgery and essential surgical care in low middle income countries. Despite this attention, the role of the first level hospital in treating children's surgical conditions remains poorly defined. To address the gap in safe surgery for children living in low middle income countries, the Global Initiative for Children's Surgery formed in 2016. The goal of GICS is to advance the access to and quality of safe surgery for all children living in low resource settings, specifically by capitalizing on the expertise of low middle income providers who have extensive experience in finding solutions in low resource environments. One of the first priorities of the low middle income providers leading the organization was the development of guidelines for optimal resources for children's surgery, which could be used excuse me, at a policy level for the integration of children's surgery and national surgical plans as a tool for gap analysis and surgical systems and, uh, evaluation, and ultimately as an ag advocacy tool for dedicated resource allocation for children's surgery. The optimal resource document was defined, written, and refined over three international meetings in London, Washington, and Vellore, India from 2016 through 2018. The guidelines are based on the input of 13 subspecialty working groups and is divided by hospital level. This is also considered a living document to be refined over time as needed. The ORCS project was recently published and includes detailed recommend, <coughs> excuse me, recommendations at each level of the healthcare system. However, as discussed at the beginning of the talk, given the importance of the district level hospital and surgical access, we chose to focus our recommendations from ORCS into a package of essential surgery and anesthesia at the district level hospital. This table highlights the key aspects of the surgery package at this level. It's broken into conditions to be treated at this level, as well as the corresponding procedures, as well as guidelines for anesthesia and perioperative care. I'd like to first consider the conditions and proposed procedures. The essential package for children's surgery at the district level hospital should include pediatric trauma care, including emergency laparotomies, basic fracture management, and minor burn care, acute abdominal emergencies such as typhoid perforations and appendicitis, and management of soft tissue infections and tube thoracostomies for pneumothorax and or empyema. In addition, the package includes stabilization and transfer of all newborn emergencies, including, for example, gastroschisis, any, any or most congenital malformations, as well as solid tumors. A second important area to highlight in the essential surgery package is that all children less than one years old be transferred to a higher level of care, given the increased risk of death from general anesthesia, which is well supported by pediatric anesthesia literature. If the procedure is truly emergent and the, and the neonate will not survive transport, we recommend that anesthesia is performed by the senior most anesthesia provider available. In addition to safe surgery, other critical priorities at this level of the healthcare system include perioperative care, such as vascular access, resuscitation, and appropriate monitoring. At GICS, we're now designing training packages to support the essential surgery package at the district level hospitals. We are organizing training materials that already exist, such as the SAVE course for general anesthesia, as well as various, as well as various trauma curriculum that, currently that are currently implemented in low middle income countries. In addition, in Nigeria just concluded their national surgical, national surgical obstetric and anesthesia plan. 
uh, and the anesthesia in, uh, package that we proposed at GIGS was, uh, was implemented with them. As implementation begins in Nigeria over the last several months, the first pilot of this, the first pilot of this package will be deployed, including training. In summary, GICS proposes a basic surgical package at the district level hospital that includes definitive treatment of traumatic, infectious, and abdominal emergencies, as well as stabilization or referral of newborns and infant emergencies as is possible. I'd like to thank Drs. Emmanuel Amre, Durok Osgides, and Steve Bickler, who are champions of this work, as well as the entire GICS team. Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. So um, are there any things set up to measure the safety or the quality and outcomes of the proposed procedures or things that you take care of there? And how, are, how do we know that the ones that we've selected are safe and appropriate? Excellent question. Thank you for it. Um, the short answer is that the, the, I suppose the implementation phase that's going on in Nigeria and also in Pakistan will hopefully afford us that ability to evaluate this proposed uh, this proposed package, but right now it's been based on expert guidance from the low-middle-income country providers that have thus proposed it. Um, as someone who's worked at the district hospital in West Africa, I think there needs to be some attention paid to neonatal emergencies that cannot be transferred, um, which in many cases, because of the remoteness of district hospitals, if it's going to take you three days to get to the capital. So what in, as is GICS looking at in terms of um, the non-transferable neonate and the safety of providing surgery at the district hospital? Would you please mention your name and institution? Sure. Sharzad Jerry Fried from Montreal. Thank, thank you for the excellent question. And I think that that's part of this package is acknowledging that very fact that at some point you're not going to be able to transfer these neonates. And so um, the training package that we're proposing is looking at those emergencies and how do we so support the providers in these district level hospitals that are performing these procedures, both in, from an anesthesia capability as well as a surgical capability. So giving them the training materials that they need in those very cases to be able to perform as safely as possible those emergency procedures. Thank you. Thanks so much. Next up is the paper titled Comparison of Ugandan and North American Pediatric Surgery Fellows Operative Experience Opportunities for Global Training Exchange presented by Dr. Reed. Thank you. And thank you so much for the opportunity to present our work. No authors have any disclosures. As a quick background, people living in Sub-Saharan Africa and especially Eastern Africa have very limited access to surgical care and pediatric subspecialty care is especially scant. In fact, the area that's highlighted on this map in front of you um, covers a region that has as many people living in it as in the United States of America, but only about 2,000 surgeons of all specialties to provide all their surgical care. This leads to a huge backlog of complex cases and complex pathologies for sick patients. Meanwhile, in North America, there's a surgeon density that's more than 300 times greater than that and there's a national concern developing over the progressive uh, diminution of pediatric surgical fellows' access to uh, index cases as well as their procedural training. Therefore, given what we think we know about each region's pediatric surgery case availability, we aim to describe the number and types of cases that were logged by Ugandan pediatric surgery fellows and compare those to those logged by North American fellows. The Ugandan pediatric surgery fellows in the study were trained primarily at Milago Hospital in Kampala. This is the largest national referral center for pediatric surgery services in the country and acts as the referral center for the most complex patients. At the time of this study, Milago was the only hospital that had pediatric surgery capabilities and it had one full-time faculty member. It has over 1,500 beds and delivers over 100 babies daily. On the North American side of the study, we use the ACGME's national data report in order to compare the case logs available for graduating uh, residents in 2016. You can see here that there is a description of the procedure either by organ and location or the specific procedure in some cases. On the Ugandan side, we then gathered the self-reported case logs from those fellows that trained at and graduated from uh, Mulago's hospital in Uganda from 2011 through 2016. The case logs are reported to COSEXA, 
which is the College of Surgeons of East Central and Southern Africa, which fills accreditation um, similar to the ABS and ACGME in the United States. Here's our results. Here you can see in the blue the total number of cases reported by our graduating pediatric surgery fellows in the United States was about 800 at the time of graduation, compared to those in red, which was about 1,000 for those graduating in Uganda. Here you can see that I've uh, broken out the two fellows that graduated in Uganda during those years into pink and red, comparing them to the blue, which is North American fellows. You can see some selected thoracic case comparison totals here with some variable totals of uh, TE fistula repair and CDH repair. In general, CDH was better represented by the North Americans. When comparing vascular access procedures, North American fellows average many more central line placements as well as ECMO cannulations. Both, of course, are procedures that are typically performed on very sick neonates in critical care settings. However, Ugandan fellows generally perform many more major tumor resections. In particular, both fellows perform many more nephrectomies than did American fellows. And there was a similar trend for sacrococcygeal teratoma resections. The notable exception was for neuroblastomas in which there were uh, more resected in the United States and Canada. We selected a few other cases that had interesting comparisons as well. Ugandan fellows performed virtually no fund application procedures, and North American fellows performed more coles and appendectomies, which isn't shown here. Ugandan fellows also performed many more procedures for complex anorectal and colorectal pathologies. Shown here is a representative um, handwritten case log from one day in the operating room there. You can see the number of PSARPs performed. In conclusion, we've described some major differences in the composition of Ugandan and North American trainees' case logs. In particular, Ugandan fellows log more cases overall, and especially log more major tumor resections and cases for the resection or repair of complex anorectal pathologies. Whereas North American trainees, in comparison, log more procedures that require laparoscopy and advanced critical care infrastructure. Given the complementary case logs in the surgical workforce crisis in Sub-Saharan Africa, North American fellows training may benefit from an organized exchange program, while well, Ugandan fellows could utilize critical care and laparoscopy training opportunities. Thank you so much, and I'd appreciate any questions. So what do you foresee as any barriers to this exchange program that um, certainly uh, each individual fellow would benefit from? I think one major barrier is the process of um, uh, accreditation and verification in the United States and Canada in order to have visiting fellows come and uh, gain those experiences in the United States and Canada. I think that um, uh, some ways around that would be to have a, um, for example, very well-structured um, observership, for example, in critical care, in which procedural skills maybe weren't the main focus, but um, really focused rounding and educational opportunities otherwise were. Uh, Eric Weber from Vancouver. Um, we've trained three Ugandan fellows, including one of the co-authors on this paper, and it has been a great opportunity for us. Interestingly, talking to our current fellow going back, her major impediment is whether she's going to have a job to go to, that is whether they're going to be paid. So um, I think we also have to look at what is our goal as, a, as pediatric surgeons in this part of the world in terms of helping these people. I'm not sure that sending trainees or going over and doing cases, although it feels good, I mean, if we train, help them to do the work, then we have to also you know, help them work in a system that's going to support them through their careers. Thank you. I, I think that your point brings up a really, really important point for further discussion and a, certainly a problem that we can't solve here today <laughs> at the podium. Um, what that brings up is the importance of that um, really bilateral um, cooperative agreement and the relationships that are forged among surgeons, um, nurses, anesthetists, and educators at all levels on both sides. And um, that's probably, I think, one of the most impressive, exciting, and rewarding parts of starting to um, come in on this project is to see how far those relationships really go. Thank you. Hey, uh, thank you so much for an interesting presentation. Uh, my name is Alex Peters. I'm a resident at Cornell and currently a Global Surgery Fellow uh, up here at Harvard. Um, 
quick question. It, it, from what I understood, the two Ugandan fellows were both graduating. These are the graduation numbers. What accounts for the fairly significant difference it looked like in among different case categories? I think T, fistula, hernia repair, they, they seem to be pretty unbalanced. Any idea what accounts for that? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, one of the most interesting areas, I think, where we see some um, uh, differences in the actual biology of these diseases, which hasn't really been described yet, is on the oncology side. You might have noted how many more nephrectomies were performed um, in Africa, but um, how many uh, more retroperitoneal uh, tumor resections and perhaps um, specifically neuroblastomas were resected on the United States and Canadian side. And I think that that's pointing to an underlying difference in epidemiology and biology that hasn't been described yet and is a really ripe area for research and collaboration. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, next up, randomized trial investigating the impact of drug disposal bag provision on the rate of postoperative opioid disposal in pediatric surgical patients, presented by Dr. Cooper from Nationwide Children's. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Jennifer Cooper. I'm a research assistant professor at Nationwide Children's Hospital, and today I'll be discussing our trial um, investigating the impact of drug disposal bag provision on the rate of postoperative opioid disposal in pediatric surgical patients. The school, it's a, it's a PC. And we have nothing to disclose. So despite recent efforts to reduce postoperative opioid prescribing, um, these medications are still often prescribed in excess and unfortunately are rarely disposed of appropriately. This lack of prompt and proper opioid disposal places children in particular at risk of um, accidental ingestion and also enables the diversion of these medications for non-medical use. Currently, the US FDA recommends utilizing take-back options for the disposal of unused or expired opioids. If these are inaccessible, uh, they do recommend flushing. Um, however, it's um, clear that many families may find take-back options to be inconvenient, and some may also have concerns about the potential environmental effects of flushing. OK, thank you. Um, to date, several studies have targeted the problem of excess opioid disposal. Okay, the roller. Use the roller to uh, scroll. Okay, sorry about that. To date, several studies have targeted the problem of non-disposal of excess opioids after surgery by providing patients and families with educational materials describing recommended methods for safe opioid disposal. These have targeted adult surgical patients, and they've um, had mixed results. This lack of consistent impact may be due to the inconvenience of recommended methods of opioid disposal or to patients' desire to retain their opioids for future pain after surgery. Another alternative to uh, take-back options or disposal by flushing is the use of drug disposal products. Uh, one of those is shown here. The Deterra drug disposal bag consists of a small pouch of activated charcoal that, when mixed with water, absorbs medication that's placed in the bag, whether in pill, liquid, or patch form, uh, thereby allowing for its safe disposal in the home garbage. Now, many government organizations, health systems, and pharmacy chains are already distributing these bags or similar products to patients, but it's really unclear whether providing these uh, products to surgical patients increases their rate of proper postoperative opioid disposal. So to answer this question, we performed a randomized controlled trial of pediatric surgical patients and their families. We included parents and guardians of children aged 1 to 17 who were having outpatient otolaryngologic or urologic surgery and were expected to be prescribed an opioid at discharge per standard of care at our institution for the procedure. Patients, or excuse me, participants, being parents and guardians, were randomized to receive either standard education by the care team or to standard education plus the receipt of a drug disposal bag. And during the entire course of our uh, trial, standard education consisted of a handout called Important Facts to Know When Taking Opioids, um, as well as a video that contained the same information. This was given to every family in our two outpatient surgery centers, and these materials described proper opioid use, storage, and disposal, but made no mention of drug disposal products. 
Patients in the intervention group additionally all received a doTERRA drug disposal bag, and a research assistant went over with them in the preoperative uh, care area um, the information on the back of the bag describing its proper use. Uh, 210 families were assessed for eligibility in the trial. Um, actually, 202 agreed to participate, 103 of whom received a disposal bag, and 99 of whom received standard education only. 21 were lost to follow-up, either because no opioid was actually prescribed or the parent or guardian didn't complete a follow-up survey at two to four weeks after surgery. An additional 27 um, participants were excluded in our protocol analyses because they either didn't fill their child's opioid prescription or their child had no leftover opioids after their pain had resolved. Here are some baseline characteristics of our study population. Most of the patients in our trial were young children who had undergone tonsillectomy. Most were prescribed hydrocodone in liquid formulation. About 15% of included families had someone living in their household who had chronic pain, and about 5% had someone living in the household who was currently using prescribed opioids. Here are the results of our trial. In our intention to treat analyses, 71.7% um, of families in the intervention group did properly dispose of their child's leftover opioids, um, much higher than actually we see in the adult setting. 56.2% of families in the standard care group did properly dispose of their child's opioids, uh, with proper disposal being defined as an FDA-recommended method or a use of a drug disposal bag. This difference was similar when disposal by any method, including those not recommended, was considered. Um, interestingly, a slightly smaller percent of families in the intervention group did fill their child's opioid prescription. Among families who disposed of their child's leftover opioids, the vast majority of those who received a disposal bag did use the bag for opioid disposal. And in the standard care group, the majority disposed of their child's leftover opioids by <laughs> simply flushing them down the toilet or sink. Very few actually utilized take-back options, being take-back events or disposal boxes at law enforcement agencies or authorized pharmacies. And the results in our per-protocol analysis that excluded um, participants who didn't fill their child's opioid prescription or whose child had no leftover opioids after their pain had resolved um, were quite similar to those in the intention to treat analysis. So in conclusion, providing a drug disposal bag to the caregivers of children receiving postoperative opioids does increase the likelihood of opioid disposal. And based on our results, we feel that greater availability of drug disposal products can really complement prescribing reduction efforts in the fight to end the opioid epidemic. And thank you for your attention. Krista Grant from Hershey. Um, nice study. It was pretty striking, though, that 84% of your families had leftover opioids, and a lot of them were TNAs. So how do we change our behavior in just not giving as many? Can we give any guidelines for the type of surgery, how many pills? That's 87% is really, really high. It is very high, and unfortunately, <laughs> it's consistently high when you look at institutions even today. I think. Um, uh, certainly our institution and our um, division of otolaryngology is definitely targeting reducing opioid prescribing. I know there are some institutions where after tonsillectomy opioids are, are never even prescribed at all. Um, I don't think our institution is headed in that direction, um, but they definitely have done studies where they've contacted participants after surgery, uh, contacted patients after surgery to see how much they're taking. Um, we did the same in our study, but those results have led them to decrease over time, and they're still looking to do that further. Very quick question, please. Um, I've got two. We'll do the quicker. Uh, Chris Reed from Duke at Durham. I was wondering if you could actually explain how the bag works a little bit more. It's, you mentioned there's activated charcoal, maybe how much it costs and um, if other yeah. people are starting to use them. Yeah, it's a very simple process, uh, similar to what might be used in the ED if um, something poisonous uh, were ingested. Uh, it's really just a small pouch of activated charcoal, as I mentioned. Um, the family adds um, warm water to the bag, shakes it up. And through an adsorption process, it um, adsorbs the, the medication. It can be used with pills, liquid, patches. It's actually something that's being distributed widely by law enforcement agencies. There are some health systems and pharmacy um, chains that give them, or similar products, Dispose Rx is a similar product. Um, they give them to all patients getting opioid prescriptions. But no one's really studied it scientifically to see how often these products are used after mm -hmm. surgery. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Sorry, we don't have, we're out of time for this. Uh, abstract. It's the last one in this last paper in our session is the uh, uh, speaking about the feasibility of spinal anesthesia in infants undergoing advanced laparoscopic and thoracic surgery by Dr. Elizabeth Suka uh, from New Hampshire. All right. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. 
So as awareness grows uh, regarding the safety and the neurodevelopmental side effects of general anesthesia, uh, especially as the FDA issued its warning on general anesthesia risks uh, late in 2016, we had expanded already our use of spinal anesthesia in babies, and this was to include older infants and toddlers, as well as complex procedures, uh, including advanced laparoscopy. So the aim of this study was to look at the feasibility and safety of spinal anesthesia in this population. So we performed a retrospective review of all pediatric surgery procedures over the last couple of years. It's a unique practice, a single solo practice pediatric surgeon with three pediatric board certified anesthesiologists. Uh, so this is a community non-academic hospital setting, which I think is notable. Uh, all but one spinal anesthetic were successful. That's a 99.3% success rate, and no conversions to general anesthesia occurred intraoperatively. The average ra uh, age ranged from preterm, preemies, 31 weeks corrected age, all the way up to 14 months of age. So this corresponded to uh, just under 1.5 kilos, up to uh, a max of over 10 kilos. And these were not all healthy babies. These were ASA 3s and 4s, NICU babies, congenital anomalies, car uh, chronic lung disease. So the average week uh, age was 13.9 weeks. I tend to think in months. So uh, just the spectrum scattered across 3.3 uh, months of age, but you know, ranging four to six months of age, uh, but certainly as the study went on, um, some larger, older babies. Looking at the corresponding weights, um, previously before looking at our data, uh, we had an arbitrary cap of around eight kilos that we would offer spinal anesthesia, and this was expanded such that there was uh, no arbitrary upper limit. So we did tend to do larger, older kids as the study period went on. This was a standard bupivacaine hyperbaric dose of spinal anesthesia. Looking at the total time it takes to place the spinals, uh, 4.6 minutes was the time, actually including the timeout, the procedure itself, the spinal placement, and IV placement when necessary. So this was a total of 4.6 minutes, ranging from 2 minutes to 8 minutes. And similarly, after the procedure had completed, from the time the dressings were on until wheels out the door, was an average of 5.6 minutes. So we do not have an internal comparison group for, spinal, uh, for general anesthesia in infants during the same time period, but certainly this is uh, lower than most of our general experience would be. So outcomes, uh, again, 148 out of 149 were successfully placed. There were two babies that came to the operating room with the intention of a spinal, but uh, the spinal was not started because of limitations in positioning. Uh, once procedure was underway, there were no uh, conversions to a general anesthesia intraoperatively, and there were no respiratory, apnea-related, spinal-related, or surgical complications. So there were a number of uh, larger babies that we employed intranasal fentanyl pre uh, preoperatively, actually pre-spinal, so in the pre-op area, just to facilitate placement of spinal, some of our larger, bigger babies. Uh, similarly, about 7% required intraoperative um, light sedation. This is just a single dose, usually at the time of pneumoperitoneum for babies. Surgical time ranged around 36 minutes, and this was a range from small, quick, seven-minute procedures all the way up to certainly an outlier of 130 minutes. Most of them were in the 60 to 80-minute range uh, at the topmost. And this is just a, a slide that will show the assortment, the complexity, as well as the time taken to do each case. Uh, I tend to think of procedures as being about 60 minutes under a spinal anesthesia. So laparoscopic pyloromyotomies, we did 25 of these over the course of the study period. Uh, took about 30 minutes. I'll just point out a couple here. Laparoscopic G-tubes and G-J tubes, about 30 minutes. Uh, there's one notable uh, longer case. The 130-minute case was a simple closure of an ileostomy. 
Um, and uh, this one took longer than I thought it would, I might, uh, but uh, the baby did well, and even at the end, we did a circumcision to complete. Um, again, hernias, preterm hernias, hernias with laparoscopy, bilateral, incarcerated hernias, hernias with other pr uh, procedures added, um, orchiopexy, circumcisions. In particular, I wanted to note uh, the laparoscopic cases. So again, 25 laparoscopic pyloromyotomies. About a quarter of these needed a single dose of sedation. Um, again, spontaneously ventilating um, and awake babies. Laparoscopic G-tubes and complicated GJ tubes. Um, there was uh, 66 hernia repairs over this, and 38 of them had laparoscopy just for the diagnostic uh, laparoscopic look and a laparoscopic orcupexy. And again, uh, pointing out some of the complex things which I think should um, push our limits of where we would consider to do spinal. A couple of cases of gastroschisis, one needed a line, the ileostomy closure, gastrostomy closures, um, not just gastrostomy tubes, but uh, primary GJ tubes with fluoroscopy and Seldinger technique, uh, chest wall mass for those upper, I'm sorry, lower thoracic upper abdominal wall dermatomes, uh, and hernias, as I mentioned, not just a straightforward single side hernia, but bilaterals, preemies, incarcerated, uh, orchiopexies. So in conclusion, uh, spinal anesthesia for older and sicker infants undergoing complex procedures, including laparoscopy, uh, that envelope should be pushed. It's highly effective, it's safe, it improves efficiency of anesthesia care, uh, increasing um, the rate of both pre- and post-op care. Uh, it avoids or reduces post-operative monitoring needs. And preferentially, we should think to use this in our highest risk patients, not just our um, most healthy. Uh, and it does provide a safe and adequate surgical environment. So I'd be happy to take any questions. So the um, time course of the spinal, the 130 minutes seems long. What would you advise against a certain time period to not try a uh, spinal, anesthe spinal anesthesia? I think in my mind, if I think that I can do something within about you know, 60 to 90 minutes, I think that's an acceptable duration of spinal anesthesia. In that particular 130-minute case, uh, Right around 60 minutes, there was a small intraoperative dose of fentanyl, and the baby did well for the rest of the time, and as I said, was doing well enough to have a circumcision at the end. So 90 minutes is probably what I went in thinking that I could probably do it in, and it was a little more complicated. 